Thank you, Lord. Connect Church, it's good to be in the house of the Lord with you today. It would remind us to go ahead and the kids can be dismissed, actually, before I get rolling here. If you're a, if you're a little one and you don't want to hear me drone on today, this is your chance to make an exit. Amen. So the last couple of weeks, Brother Joel has done such a wonderful job. I don't, you know, Brother Joel serves a little bit behind the scenes. I don't know if the church as a whole has come to appreciate the gift that the Lord has sent us in this brother. Um, so we thank him for bringing the word the last two weeks, but we also thank him for just bringing a, a new dimension to the leadership team at Connect. Ashley was telling me a little bit about how Joel interacts in the staff meetings, which I, I don't usually have the opportunity to attend. And it's just a blessing to see how the Lord moves the chess pieces around and fills the need we have. So thank you, Brother Joel. We appreciate it. So Brother Joel has done such a wonderful job of establishing the, the, the glorious lifestyle of the godly in the order that God has created, right, these last two weeks. And today we're going to take a little bit of a turn. If you remember in science class, Usually you, you had to learn the theory first, you had to learn the, the material, and then you would go into the lab and you would apply that material. So today as we move into chapter 2, we're going to get into the lab work, but before we do that, we want to read the scripture that's the overarching theme for this series. So if you would, stand with me one last time as we read Titus 1, verse 1. Titus 1 verse 1 says, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. So one thing that's important to our, our local industry, the oil and gas industry, it's very important for our local economy. It actually was, it was very important for this church as well. Those of you that were members of Oak Park know there were many people that were in the oil and gas industry. Am I right, Mr. Tyrone? That's right. We have plenty of people still here today that are in the oil and gas industry. And for those of us that are not in that industry, we look at a refinery or we look at a, an oil rig offshore and we see just a tangled web of pipes and tanks that are connecting various processes that are going on. And as we think about the parallels to the Christian life, we're called to be, to be pipes, right, rather than tanks. We're not called to hoard all of our goodies. We're called to be conduits where God's love can flow out to others. And in the, in the physical, in our analogy with the oil and gas industry, Pumps are vital to keep things moving through these pipes. So we're going to look at a pump curve here. I'm going to take a little bit of a little bit of a risk here. This is a let's let's talk about a pump curve. We have that. Uh, it's not going to look good if it's not on the screen. Look at that! Isn't that a thing of beauty? No, it is not. So. We're not going to get worried about what's going on with this pump curve, but just know that pump designers will publish a pump curve so that engineers can then take that curve and figure out, well, how am I going to use this pump? It's hard to see, but if you notice these blue lines, those are lines of efficiency. So if we go to the next slide, we'll see that there's an area right around here and that's called the preferred operating range. And the pump designers are saying, look, you can operate your pump anywhere in this area. But if you really want the pump to work the best, you want to operate it at our next slide at something that is called the best efficiency point. So that, that little dot right there in the middle, if you want your pump to last the longest, if you want it to not make any noise, if you want it to to be a good running pump for as long as it can be, you want to operate your pump right there at the BEP. So with that context, 
Let's read our text for today in Titus 2, starting with verse 1. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. So we see in this passage God's order that we've been learning about these last two weeks in very practical ways, and that brings us to to chapter one of our story that we're telling today, the original design. So just like the designers of that pump provided documentation to the engineers, this is how you use the pump, and just how engineers take that guidance and they write operating instructions to say, this is how this particular pump is used in this particular place. The Lord has given us operating instructions in his word, right? He's given us lists like this that say, these are the things that you should do if you want the human machine to run as close to its best efficiency point as possible. These are the things that we should do. We may not like those parameters, but this is the machine we've been given. And so it makes sense for us to to pay attention to the original design that was in mind. Amen? So we start off this section with admonitions for older men. And Paul goes through the, the various the various points that older men are to, to exemplify, sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, they're to be sound in faith and love. And so if we sum all that up, Paul is basically saying older men are called to be respectable. We're called to reflect God to those around us. Our lives shouldn't be characterized by silliness or jokes, although it's fine to have fun. We want to have fun. But we want to do that in the context of of being a respectable older man. Admonitions for older women, there's a lot to unpack here. Reverent behavior, not slanderers, not addicted to wine, to teach what is good, to train young women. We can can sum up all of what's told to these older women in a similar way. They're, They're to be respectable, they're to lead respectable lives, lives of purpose lives that are pouring into others in ways that only women can. There's a unique responsibility that our older women have for the church. And as we move on to admonitions for, for younger men, it's kind of interesting. We see that the Lord has given older women all of these things to remember to do. Younger men, this one thing, self-control, So we see right here, my wife tells me she can multitask, and she can. She can handle a lot going on at one time. I cannot. So we see God gives all of these admonitions to to older women because he knows they can handle it. The younger men, though, control yourself. You get that right, then you can come back for more. You get that right, and then we'll talk. He goes on after that, admonitions for all of us. We're to be a model of good works. We're to teach with integrity. Admonitions for bond servants. So we can, we can think about that as we're called to submit to those that are in authority over us, whether that's the church, our bosses at work, the local government. We're to be obedient to these authorities as we're obedient to Christ. So as we think through what we've just been told 
it, it, it came to my mind that in our Sunday morning equip class, Brother Tommy right now is, is leading us through Galatians. Before that, Brother Lawrence led us through Romans. And we, we're wading through some deep waters. Paul, is, Paul has some, it's some meat. It's some gristle. It's, it's doctrines that you have to chew on. If you try to swallow this thing too early, you're going to choke. These are heavy doctrines, right? Even Peter says in, in 2 Peter, I think he said, you know, sometimes Paul can just be hard to understand. And we can relate to that. But you know what? This text that we're reading today is not one of those times. This is not one of those times. We can read every one of these words, and we don't have to go back and, and find out, well, what were, what, what's the Greek word study of this? What did this mean to the original hearers so that we can now understand how to apply this to our lives, right? We know exactly what Paul is trying to communicate to us as we read this list, right? So we're not wading through the deep waters but we are going to now delve into chapter 2, which is the compromised design. So the question before us is, when you heard that list, what did you think? What came to mind when you heard that list? All these things that characterize those that desire to live their life according to God's order and God's design. You know, it may be that some of us would be honest enough to say that sounds pretty straight-laced, maybe even puritanical. It just sounds, maybe it sounds boring. It's like, where's the fun in that? C.S. Lewis tells a story of a young boy that was asked, what do you think God is like? And the young boy says, you know, as far as I can tell, God is a sort of person who's always snooping around trying to see if anyone's enjoying himself and then trying to stop it. <laughs> Can we relate to that? C.S. Lewis goes on to say, I'm afraid that's the sort of idea that the word morality raises in a good many people's minds. Something that interferes, something that stops you having a good time. In reality, moral rules are directions for running the human machine. So let's think about this. We're going to do a little thought experiment here. If, if anyone was so honest as to say that that passage that we read just didn't sound like a lot of fun, what if we flipped the script? What if we taught everyone the exact opposite of Titus 2? We'll just take a little portion of it, verse 2 through 6. We're going to call this anti-Titus 2, verses 2 through 6. What would that read like? You can see it on the screen. You won't find this in your word. Older men are to be jovial, undignified, indulgent, unreliable, irresponsible lovers of themselves. Older women, likewise, are to be irreverent in their behavior, slanderers of others, and are to sip their wine freely. They are not to teach what is good but are to encourage the young women to disrespect their husbands and neglect their children, to be free in impurity, going from house to house, idlers and busybodies, and ruling over their own husbands that the word of God may be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to do whatever they feel like doing. Does that sound like fun? Does that sound like a society you want to live in? A, so a society you want to raise a family in? No. But as somebody just said, that is exactly the playbook that our world is using to play the game. That is exactly what they're doing today, right? We are running our human machine. We're running our society, our culture, off rules that are in complete disagreement with its original plan. You know, men are told to stand down. My whole life, men have been gradually told to step aside, stand down. We have a, we have a lack of honorable leadership, do we not? We have a breakdown of the family. 
I'd go so far as to say, you know, the family's not dying. It's being murdered. There's an intentionality to what is going on here. We jail our elderly for daring to pray for the unborn. Increasing divisions among people groups. All of this is a result of generations telling God, nope, I'm going to do it my way. I know better. Scripture says there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is death, right? I can do this better. I don't care how the machine is supposed to run. I'm going to run it my way. And we wonder why we look around us and it feels like life has fallen apart. The pump is vibrating off its stand. It's been running run way off the, the chart that we looked at earlier. You know, there's a... There's a case study in Deuteronomy. We talked about it after Tommy's class this morning. Deuteronomy chapter 28. We're not going to read, obviously, the whole thing this morning. It's a long chapter. The first 14 chapters of Deuteronomy 28 are an account of the blessings of doing things God, what, God's way. The blessings of obedience. After those 14 chapters, 53 verses of the curses of doing things our own way. We won't read it, but I, we, we talked about one particular verse this morning after, after class that says in verse 28, the Lord will strike you with madness and blindness and confusion of mind. And sometimes we look around us and we say, what are we thinking? We're confused of mind, but we're experiencing nothing new. That chapter is in the, the Word as well as many other chapters to, to teach us. This is how God deals with his rebellious people. It's nothing new. We experience this when we don't run the machine according to God's design. So let's assume that I've convinced you that God's design is best. And we say, yep, we want to do it God's way. And then what? How do we do this? That brings us to chapter three. There's a relevant design here. So we've been talking kind of in generalities up to this point, but now we're going to focus more on the individual. If you were convicted that you may be operating your machine a little more closely to the world's playbook as opposed to God's playbook, how do you change? Maybe you've tried this before. No doubt we all have. I can tell you I do not want to be the same Kyle a year from now that I am today. I certainly don't want to be a worse Kyle. But you know, my experience in Scripture both tells me that that's a very real possibility. It's a very real possibility that I won't be better a year from now than I am today. So how do we ensure that I'm becoming a better Kyle next year, that you're becoming a better person, that we're operating our lives closer to that spiritual BEP? So name someone in Scripture that changed. This is not rhetorical. Sing it on out. Who, who changed in Scripture? Saul, Peter. That's it. Abraham, Joseph. We don't have to think hard, do we? This is the business that God has been in since we fell, is redeeming mankind. So we have a lot of examples of people who have changed, who realized, I was walking this way, I need to walk this way now. And so, so how, do they, how do they do this? I can give you a, maybe an example closer to home. Uh, my, my spiritual walk has been characterized primarily by long seasons of slow and steady growth. And I think that's right. That's how God designs it. Just like a tree grows a little bit every year and it's a strong tree. It's got nice, tight growth rings. That's the kind of growth we want. But every once in a while in my life, God has brought about a season of change that was very noticeable. And I can think of one time in particular, many times, but, but the one that came to mind was I was sitting in a conference and the speaker puts a quote up on the screen, and I read that quote, and I said, hmm, that's a good quote. I'm going to buy that book. So that's what I did. I got home, I bought that book, 
And I read that book. And one chapter in that book forever changed my marriage. Forever changed my marriage. Now, why did that happen? Was it because I knew something now that I didn't know before? That's probably part of it, right? That's probably part of it. But something else had to, had to happen because I learned countless things on any given day that I didn't know before that don't affect my life. So what was it about that? Another example, last week in our deacon meeting, we were talking about natural logarithms. And this was some topic that came up. You may think we're just talking about how to serve the church better, but every once in a while, we dive in a little bit. And we could say the natural logarithm, now believe me, I did not know this by memory. I had to look this up. The natural logarithm of a number is its logarithm to the base of the mathematical constant E. That's true. Or we could say, if you don't like that, the natural logarithm maps the multiplication of positive numbers into addition, right? Jason's liking this. Brother Jason says, yes, preach the natural logarithms. Or we could say, the natural logarithm gives you the time needed to, to reach a certain level of growth. And all of those things about the natural logarithm, as true as they are, they don't matter to us. They don't help us pay the bills. They don't help us lead our families according to God's truth. We don't need to use slide rules anymore. So they're true. They're just irrelevant. They're irrelevant. Jesus said in John 17, 17, your word is truth. He was echoing David's proclamation from Psalm 19. Read this with me. Psalm 19, starting in verse 7. This is good stuff. The word says, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. We can read that passage, and as true as it is, we can walk out of those doors and be completely unchanged. Why? A thing can be true and irrelevant at the same time. That's the strategy of the enemy for our times. Sure, God's a thing. He just doesn't matter. That's the lie, that God doesn't matter. Run your engine any way you want to. Run your pump any way you want to. It just doesn't matter. But back to our question, what affects a change? When we believe that the thing is true and that it matters, so basically, we're talking about a belief system here. So when we have truth, we've come to believe that that truth matters, then surely that will manifest itself in change, right? That will drive us to action, to change. And that's exactly what I used to think. In fact, we were, we being Brother Benny, Pastor Ryan, and myself, we were walking the streets of Belize earlier this year. And I was, I was making the case to this young man that our beliefs are the most important thing about us. He was making the case that no, knowledge is more important. He wasn't having anything of what I was buying, what I was selling. He wasn't buying it. I'm, and I'm, I'm going through this afterwards and I'm saying, Lord, teach me, you know, wh wh what about this? And because I was, I was justifying my position that these beliefs, these things that we that we hold, these deeply held convictions, result in, a, in action at some point. But you know, the world views beliefs as, well, I mean, I believe it's true, I can't really prove it, but I, I think it's true. So I looked in the Word and I'm, I'm thinking through and I'm saying, oh, I know, my proof text, I've got it, I've got it. 
that even the demons know that God is one and shudder. But that's not what the scripture says. When I went and looked at it more carefully, you believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. So my, 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 my truth is on the rocks here. What's going on here? This had to, had to go, as, as Tommy tells us in our equip class, you got to go see what the Greek word is. Surely there's a different Greek word for belief here. Nope. Same Greek word as, as Paul uses when he's recounting Abraham believed God. It was credited to him as righteousness. Or that we say in Romans 10, 19, when we say we, all you got to do, you got to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. You will be saved. And that is so true. But what do we do with this? Demons believe that Jesus is who he says he is. But that belief certainly doesn't translate into personal change in accordance with God's order and design, does it? So we're missing something here, aren't we? This gets us to chapter 4, the heart of God's design. Turn with me to John 3. Your Bible probably just flops open to John 3, right? John 3, one of the most famous verses in all of Scripture. But we're going to start reading in verse 17. John 3, verse 17. Scripture tells us in this passage, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Skip down to the the last verse of John 3, in verse 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not believe in the Son shall not see life. Did I read that right? Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. We would naturally expect, we're making a contrast here, if you believe this way, you have this. If you don't believe this, you have that. That's not what it says, is it? Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. So we're beginning to see this link between believing and doing. But let's look closer at verse 19. Hopefully you're still there. Look back up to verse 19. What does it say? You know, we, we listed all the reasons that judgment is rightly coming against our society earlier. We think judgment is coming. It's true, but Jesus tips his hand here. He says, this is the judgment. People loved the darkness. People loved the darkness. So our question, do we love God or do we love the darkness? Our affections are the key, the inclination of our heart. This morning, Brother Ronald, what did you say you found to be true in your teaching? Second graders, Brother Ronald is sharing how he, you got to go to the heart. Brother Ronald learned this in the classroom. The heart is the the issue. You want to change somebody? You capture their heart. You capture their heart. We love God. We do things in keeping with his character. We love the world. We play church and we act just like the world. So if there's one thing you hear outside of scripture today, hear this. Our action is driven by love. We do what we love I'm thinking of ways 
This, is a, this, is, this could be a poor analogy, but I'm a big Denzel Washington fan. Remember the movie John Q? Man took a, took a whole ER hostage. Why? Was it because somebody reminded him, hey, you know, your son needs a heart transplant, and you have a duty to provide for your son. Nobody told Denzel's character that you have a duty here. Remember, do what you, you're supposed to do. What motivated John Q to take that ER hostage was the love for his son. But we're not going to base our theology on John Q, are we? We know that love drives people to do some crazy things, some irrational things, right? Jesus in John 14, verse 15 says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, there's a, you, could, you could look at that a couple of different ways. You could say, well, in fact, the NIV translated, if you love me, keep my commandments. So the idea is like it's, it's, it's a command. Or you could read it, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, which is more like an if-then statement. It's just a statement of fact. If you love me, the natural result of that is that you will keep my commandments. First John picks up this theme in chapter 5, verse 3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. If the commands are burdensome, you got to remember to do them. If they're not burdensome, it just happens. When Joseph made the decision to put God before Potiphar's wife, was he burdened in that decision? We weren't there, but it surely doesn't seem from what we're told in Scripture that that was a burden at all. Joseph says, how can I do this and sin against God? He wanted God more than he wanted Potiphar's wife. He wanted God. It's his affections. We're not talking about duty here. We're not talking about list-keeping, self-help. Bookstores are filled with self-help books. But you know that chapter in that marriage book, it changed my marriage because it changed my heart. And it changed my heart because I loved my wife. If I learned what I learned in that chapter and I chose to do nothing about it, what would that say to my wife? I don't care about you enough to change. It changed me because it touched something that I loved and it drove me to action. If we keep reading in John 14, starting again in, in, in verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my command and I will ask the Father. He will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. This is a work of the Spirit, right? And what is the fruit? We're going to learn more about this next week in Brother Tommy's class. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Let's stop right there. Love. Love is the first fruit. Love is the first fruit. If you're a Christian, you're called to bear fruit, and the first fruit you're supposed to bear is love, and we're not talking about phileo love here. Phileo love, that's the brotherly love, the Philadelphia type of love. We're not talking about eros, that romantic love. We're talking about agape love. Agape love is a spiritual love. It's a love that's characterized by a lack of self-interest. Agape love. 1 Corinthians 13 says this kind of love never fails. Have you failed in your efforts to change before? Have you said, all right, I need to be more patient. It's good to have those, those desires, but let's do it in the context of what matters first. The first thing is to get the love right. I'm amazed at how, at how all of this parallels with what we learned this morning in our equip class. 
If you failed in your efforts to be a better person in the past, you're, you owe it to yourself to ask, well, what was I loving? When I was trying to do that, what was I loving? Was I loving maybe myself? Was I loving the image of myself in the eyes of others? Introspection is key here. Figure out what, what are you loving if something has failed in the past. Experiencing this love that we're talking about, this agape love, it naturally draws us in to that spiritual best efficiency point. So I ask you, are you going to do what God wants you to do or what you want to do? And at this point in the sermon, you should all be saying, I reject that premise. Who says I can't have both? Reject that premise. Somebody says, you want this or that? Scripture says we want both. We want to live our lives in such a way that our wants are conformed to His desires. I want to want what God wants me to want. That's our prayer. Change my heart, Lord. Make me love you more. I want to love you more. Don't fall for that. Pray that your desires will be conformed. We go back to our our overarching verse here. Paul, a servant of God, the apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth which accords with godliness or which leads to godliness. The knowledge of truth that leads to godliness, we find that Scripture tells us the path that truth takes as it leads us to godliness. Let's let's look at this, this list, this bullet point list that I've put up. Starting with knowledge, we know more about God, and so that, that leads us to love God more. That love draws us closer to that spiritual best efficiency point, and we, we want to do the things that God wants us to do, which results in righteousness or godliness. That's the progression, right? I was talking to my lovely wife about this, and she says, well, that's what she, t- that's what she says. She says, well, And then I know, uh uh-oh, I better listen here. I better listen here. She says, I think you're thinking of it more like a line, but I think it's more of a circle. I said, oh, oh, that's right. So what's that next slide look like? What's that next slide look like? I bet you could could think of this, huh? Knowledge, which leads to love, which leads to obedience, which leads to righteousness. And the more righteous we are, the more we hunger to know God more. And the cycle repeats itself again. My little lady was in good company. R.C. Sproul says, the more we know him, the more we're able to love him. The more we love him, the more we seek to know him. So we can take this even one step further. So we've got this circular pattern now in our life. Go to the next slide if you would. It's more like a spiral. You know, if, if, we, if we remember back to that pump curve, there was this big blue region, and, and we were free to operate inside that region. But as we, as we become sanctified, as we, as we submit ourselves to the Lord, we find ourselves in this, this curve that's gradually converging to be more and more like God wants us to be. Amen? Closer and closer to our spiritual best efficiency point. So the question this morning as we start to wrap this up is who has your heart? Who has your heart? If you're convicted this morning that you know I I do love God but I want to love him more. I want to love him more. I have five, six actually, six bullet points. We're going to go rapid fire through these. Six six things to consider. The first consideration, consider your taste for God. Psalm 34, 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. What if you don't think he is? What if the heavens feel like bronze sometimes? It feels like your prayers aren't going anywhere. You know, sometimes in our Christian walk, if, 
if it doesn't feel like it, you pretend it does. You do what you know you're supposed to do. We're not basing this love on feelings. This is agape love. This is a decision that we make. I command my love to you. This is not feelings. That's one way that you know it's agape love is when you don't feel like doing it all the time, but you do it anyway because you love. If you don't have that taste in your mouth, what can you do to develop that taste? Well, one thing you can do, you can be with his people like you are this morning. We're grateful that each of you have chosen to prioritize being with God's people today. Spiritual disciplines, being in the word, meditating on it, praying, memorizing it. But you know, we have an opportunity this coming week to develop the love that you have for one another, which by default means we're loving God, right? As you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. We have a neighbor that's not too happy with how we've been neighboring. So we have a work day coming up this Saturday at 8 a.m. And I, and I, I get it. This is July 27th, the hottest time of the year. We're going to get together and we're going to cut weeds. We're going to toss branches. We're going to clean up our lot for the purpose of being better neighbors to our community. But that's not the biggest purpose in my mind. I want to go to work side by side with y'all. You can learn more about somebody working with them on a missions trip or picking up sticks on a serve day than a month of Sundays, right? So first consideration, develop your taste for God. Second consideration, consider your appreciation of forgiveness. Luke 7, 47, Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. So if you find that your love for God has grown cold, it may very well be that you're harboring some unforgiveness towards others. But I guarantee you, if you will contemplate how much you've been forgiven, it was very hard to harbor unforgiveness towards others. If you see your hand around that hammer that just drove the nails into Jesus' hands and feet, and you're overwhelmed by all that God has done for me, how could you be unforgiving to others? So consider that. Our third consideration, consider your love of not God. 1 John 2, 15 and 16 says, Do not love the world or the things of the world. If, any, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, that's not from the Father. It's from the world. So if we find in our hearts something that is too enamored with this world, Jesus gives us a solution for that too. He says, invest in the kingdom where your heart, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Invest in the kingdom. Don't invest in this world. Don't be drawn by the shiny objects of this world. We want to love the things of God. Fourth consideration, consider your lack of obedience. Back to John 14, 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I think Brother Joel is a little worried right now because I haven't woven Spurgeon into this sermon. It's getting pretty, pretty late in this sermon and we still haven't had a Spurgeon appearance, but, but I got you, brother. Spurgeon says, The essence of obedience lies in the hearty love that prompts the deed rather than the deed itself. Come to appreciate God is interested in the love that prompts your obedience, much more so than he's interested in the deed itself. The lists are important in the context of God's love. Consideration number five, consider your misplaced motivation. Brother Marcel walked us through Revelation. In Revelation 2, 
to the church in Ephesus, I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you're enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you've not grown weary, and this is sounding so good, right? Yes, we're doing well. We're doing, doing, doing. But what does verse 4 say? But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Verse 5 is a solution. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. So Jesus doesn't say stop doing the works. He says repent. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was the the message of the almost greatest man that ever walked this earth, right? John the Baptist. Repent. Do the works you did at first. This is for the saved. This this, This repentance, this is not an issue of acceptance. You know, that's the... People wonder sometimes what's different about our faith from all the other major world religions. The world will tell you, look, it's all, it's all the same. We're all going to the same spot at the end. You're going to go that way. I'm going to go this way. False. That is false. What's different between Christianity and every other religion is the acceptance of every other religion comes at the end. You do the best you can do. And you're hoping when you stand in that line that you're just a little bit better than that guy that was in front of you. I just want to be a little bit better than him. I've just got to play the odds here. Christianity is not a religion, is it? It's a relationship. Our acceptance comes on the front end, not because of what we've done, but because of what Jesus has done for us. We are accepted. We are accepted. So never let anybody say we're all on the same path. And finally, the sixth consideration. Consider the state of your soul. 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if, if what we've just talked about, if If none of it rings true to you, if it didn't spark some some joy in your heart or some desire to get closer to God, if it's just gravel in your mouth, consider. Maybe you haven't experienced the goodness of God. You know, there's a very real danger. Jesus warns of this, where he says at at the last day, depart from me. I never knew you. I never knew you. People will be surprised at that. It's possible that the glory of the Lord has departed and we didn't know it. If you've not come to that saving knowledge, if you've you've chosen to run your machine the way you want to, and you've chosen to tell God, you know what, I don't want your parameters, I don't want your rules, I don't want you boxing me into this little blue zone. I don't want a relationship with you. Then what makes you think he's going to force a relationship with you for eternity? He's not going to force that on you. He'll say, be it done unto you as you've chosen. So if you haven't come to know the goodness of Christ and him crucified. We pray that you would consider that today. Speak to one of us. Say, you know, I don't, I don't know anything about what you're talking about today, but I want to. I want to know this God. I want to love this God like we chatted about this morning. And then come to us. Come to one of the leaders. Don't leave without speaking to someone. Let's pray this morning. You can sit right where you are. You can kneel. You can do business with God. This is between you and your God for those that are redeemed. 
Lord, we, we stand before you today and we repent, Lord. Father, we repent for the trappings of the world that we've run after. Lord, we repent for, for being duped by the enemy into thinking that you're just not relevant, that you just don't matter. Lord, we confess this morning, you matter to the max. Lord God, you matter to us. We love you, Lord. Father God, we love you. We, we confess, we want to love you more. We pray that you would birth within us a heart for you that, that we haven't experienced before, Lord. We want our church this day to take a stand to love you to be a place in this city where people can come and experience that love that they would know that we are christians by our love lord and lord we pray that that as we do that that we would then you know dive into i need to be more patient i need to be more kind i need to to not be angry lord that we would then focus on all of those areas, this list that we read about in Titus 2, Lord. Lord, we want to, to emulate your plan. We want to, to model this list that we read in Titus 2, but in light of the love that you have sparked in our heart, Lord. We know that we will love because you first loved us, Lord. Lord, we thank you for loving us first. We give you praise for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother Michael, if you'd lead us in that song, Behold our God. Behold our God. Yes. Seated on his throne. Yes. Come let us adore. Lord, we adore you this morning. We adore you, Lord. I pray that you were blessed by today's worship and the message that you heard. And one of the things that we're very passionate about here at Connect Church is seeing people take their next step. Even if you go to our website, you'll see that we're always encouraging people to continue to move forward. And so maybe you heard something today that you say, I want to take a next step in following Jesus as my Savior. Or maybe you want to be uh, publicly baptized. Or maybe you've been looking for a good, godly church to be a part of. We'd love for you to take any of those next steps. If you look in the description box, there's uh, links that you can click on that will help you take those next steps. And also let us know that you have so that uh, someone can reach out to you to help you in your next step of following the Lord. If you were blessed by the message today and the worship, and you really would like to contribute and invest in what God is doing here at Connect Church, we'd love for you to, to give. Uh, it's no pressure to give. We want to encourage you to give freely, not begrudgingly at all. Uh, you can also click on the link in the description box to find out how to give and to support the work uh, that God is doing right here in our community at Connect Church. My prayer is that you would join us again, whether in person or online, as we continue to glorify Christ, make disciples, and serve the city.